Good morning. It's our privilege to experience the film by Michael Conti uh, entitled Hildegard of Being an, an Unruly Mystic. And we're, we have the permission, thanks to his generosity, to share with you two of the five sections of this film. The two sections we will be seeing our uh, introduction and Hildegard, the patron saint of the arts and creativity. And secondly, uh, the theme of medicine and especially exciting will be the interviews with the German doctor who um, has worked at the Hildegard clinic in Southern Germany. The other sections of the film, her theology, her music and the history and places of Hildegard. These are available uh, to purchase on the larger um, uh, film by Michael Conti. Thank you. To Cover the mystic in everybody is to wake a culture and a religion up. Carl Jung says, only the mystic brings what's creative to religion itself. So if you're gonna renew Christianity, renew religion of any kind, I think everyone agree that it needs it today. We got to put mysticism forward. You don't know me, not yet. I'm the filmmaker here. I was traveling through Europe after a summer art program in Italy. It was 1983. All I had was a few dollars, a sketchbook, and a journal. Compared to my college hometown of Boulder, Colorado, Spain was awakening after decades of Franco's repressive rule. As I wandered in Barcelona's Las Rambla alleyways, where a young Pablo Picasso once lived, I felt a seductive promise whirling around me, like the Greek muses, enticing me to cross their threshold, to truly acknowledge the creative force within me. But what future ordeals lay ahead? What if I just kept moving and refused to acknowledge their call? My body and mind felt disconnected. More questions than answers popped up. Did my existence matter? Did I have a spiritual purpose? How would I make a living after college with a degree in fine arts? Everything simmered in that summer heat, a panic attack of sorts, which I later learned was consistent with an existential crisis. While I would like to say that I walked into a church and was comforted by St. Hildegard of Bingham, who is the subject of this film, that occurrence wouldn't happen until years later. I discovered the revolutionary call to action I had previously heard was a woman from the 12th century, a saint, whose influences in music, medicine, art, and theology are still being felt today. She had called to me like she has called to the people you're about to meet. St. Hildegard of Bingham was an unruly and revolutionary mystic whose spirit still lives within each of us, ready to awaken to her own potential. She was an incarnation of creativity whether it's her painting, her music, her poetry, her writings, her research, her healing. Uh, she finds so many modes, and, and including just her, her prose and her poetry itself, is, her language is stunning at times. She just grabs you, as she does, of course, with her music. The spirit um, flows through all things. Uh, it is what we tap into with green, what she calls greening power. And um, we tap into it with our imaginations and our creativity. Uh, this is why she says there's wisdom in all creative works. And uh, obviously, uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's a great idea. A patron saint of the artist would be Hildegard. It's that power of creation. We all need to think about what can we create in our world 
um, so that way we can affect profound change. And it's through doing what we love. Create what you love. And, um, and then in, in turn, I think that that heals ourself because it brings that very positive vibration out and that very positive um, radiance and luminance um, to ourselves, to our work, and to all that we're doing. And this is why the creation tradition that Hildegard so fully incarnates is about empowerment for everybody. And we all have to find the cosmic Christ inside us. Hildegard paints it, the man in sapphire blue in every one of us. So there is a lot of relationship between Hildegard and Ayurvedic and the Chinese. For example, Hildegard likes to cook and all the stuff she cooks are remedies. This is what uh, Hippocrates said already 2,000 years ago. Your food should be your remedy. And so if we cook a soup or if we make a meal with spelt, this is already has a purpose for your, for your health. She felt a connection to stones and knew that stones have a healing power too. So it's all these things in creation that by opening ourselves up to them in a, in a mystical way, we can um, become healers of ourselves. So, so she, was, she didn't actually heal people. She opened up a space in their spirit where they could heal themselves through a relationship with the, the, the plant world and with stones. Hildegard was a nun of the 12th century and she lived in some ways a usual life that a nun would live within a monastery. Uh, focused on the divine liturgy, focused on holy work, as they would call it, the work of God. The two uh, main points of the Benedictine rule, um, prayers and work, they did not change since Hildegard. And this is also characteristic for our life here, so we have to earn the money for our life and all things here, the house and so on, by our own hands, as it's said in the rule of St. Benedict. Hildegard was the 10th child of um, Hildebert and, and Mechtild, and uh, she was, you can sort of think of it as she was offered as a tithe to, to the monastery. Hildegard was born in 1098 in Bermersheim, on the other side of the Rhine, as um, the 10th child in her family. Um, her, her parents were noblemen, and with 14 years she came uh, to the Dizzy Bodenberg. And remember that marriage was arranged um, for political reasons. And maybe Hildegard wouldn't have been, well, seemed like she might not have been a great obedient wife because she had a lot of character, personality, and intelligence, and that was obvious right away. And she was given into the care of a woman named Judah of Spanheim, who was an anchoress in that monastery. And that means a woman who would have been enclosed in an area for a life of prayer and reflection. And there's controversy about uh, how healthy Yuta was. After Yuta died, it was like she blossomed. And she did do things in a different way. And my interpretation has always been, look, this woman was her mentor. And obviously Hildegard had a great mentor because she she learned a lot about music and, of course, a lot about study and reading and writing uh, and, and painting. So all those, it seems to me, all those um, skills and arts were passed on to her by someone as a child, and Juju was her mentor. Oddly enough, Hildegard doesn't mention Jetta very much in her writings, and Jetta had this very ascetic, strict observance of the Benedictine rule that Hildegard, when she eventually takes control does not necessarily follow. Hildegard is much more moderate in her interpretation of the rule. And I wonder if that in itself can tell us that Hildegard was actually rather overwhelmed and disenchanted with it when she was a young girl. Uh, Jatta's own interpretation of it was, I, I can imagine, too strict <laughs> in, in some ways for Hildegard. I'm really glad that Hildegard didn't have the same kind of spirituality that Jutta did. 
I don't get into the flagellation and the beating of the body. I, because to me, and I think to Hildegard, from what we know about her and how she adorned her sisters, the body was the temple of the divine. And you don't beat that up. Because for me, to live in the cloister meant that I was truly the bride of Christ. And I would never leave there. And I could be in communion through meditation and prayer and deeply intimate with the Christ energy. To compose 77 songs, to produce the first morality play, to write nine books, to found two monasteries, to, to have a healing ministry, to write books on herbs and stones, and to heal people with the right foods and understand the mysteries of animal, the animal kingdom, it just blows your mind. And so yes, she was the saint of creativity for sure. To be a superstar in the Middle Ages meant to excel in holiness. And yes, she was. She was recognized um, by people, not just in Germany, but all over Europe as a very special for, uh, person, a, very, a superstar, if you will. People wrote to her, they came to her. Once her fame was established, um, she had many visitors. She received letters from many places. So when we think about what her monastery would have been like, we need to remember there was a lot of activity. It says all of creation is a symphony of joy and jubilation. And when Hildegard was a little girl, she had visions. And this, of course, was one of her visions, which she didn't reveal uh, until her midlife. She heard a voice um, telling her to write down all she heard and saw. She heard the voice of the living light calling her to preach. And I remember the day in my kitchen when I, this awareness was really coming to my consciousness and I sat down and I said a, a quick prayer, please take this away from me. I don't want to do this, it's too scary, and uh, please take this away so that I can just be like I was before. Just totally uh, shook her by the strength of it because God told her to speak and write what she heard and what she saw. She was really bedridden half the time. She was in a lot of pain. Kept it in for a while, then she discussed it with her secretary and mentor who went to the abbot and said, uh, listen, abbot, Hildegard had this vision and she's very convinced that God is telling her to speak and write and I believe her. And of course we all know there's no turning back and once the opening begins um, it just continues to unfold and so Hildegard was so uh, important to me because I think from her I gained uh, courage, I gained um, that inner strength and that sense of being called in all those different, in various ways, one of them being to interpret the scriptures, that's part of the 1141 vision also, moved her to keep writing. She wrote um, two works on um, what we call nowadays medicine, but it's not really about medicine because she compiled the knowledge of her time concerning herbs and such things. And um, if, uh, it is a difficult thing because you cannot uh, divide it from the creator, from God. And if you do that, then uh, it goes in the esoteric way and something like that. And this is not um, what uh, we want to do in our shop. So we have uh, just some herbs or something, but not um, what other people would like us to have. So. She wrote her books through visions, through inspiration. She didn't do research on that. It's impossible because she had only two years in her life to write the medicinal books. So, and it's about 2,000 remedies. So how can you uh, make research on people with 2,000 drugs? So it was inspired. 
she, for example, she took the stone in her hand and says, what's with the chalcedony? What kind of healing forces are in there? And she got that idea inspired or envisioned and dictated that to a monk because she was not able to write herself. So we have more of her intellectual contributions to her culture than we do for any woman from the Middle Ages. And I think if she were a man, she would be recognized perhaps as one of the greatest figures of the Middle Ages. Hildegard had a sense of being human that never departed from her. And, and for her, the human was beautiful. She really believed that being made in the image of God meant that we too are creators. And so we sort of have a responsibility to create, to add to that which is good, you know? God said, you know, let there be light, and there was light and it was good. And so that's part of our divinity, is to create goodness and beauty. God loves man, and um, his love flows over the world which um, she says in one of her songs, Caritas Abundat. And uh, this is also um, a very important point um, people um, have to know nowadays. That God wants um, to be in relation with man. And that's uh, why he created the world where we live. And because um, Adam and Eve uh, did not work so good at the beginning, <laughs> He tried to come into relation with human beings again by sending his son in the world. And this is the important message, which also is nowadays um, an important message still. Aquinas says, the same spirit that hovered over the waters at the beginning of creation hovers over the mind of the artist at work. In other words, creation is still going on and in a special way in human imagination. And Hildegard says that too in her own words. It was billed as a rebirthing retreat, timed to coincide with spring equinox. As I walked the grounds of Dizzy Botenberg, the hilltop sanctuary of Hildegard's first abbey, above two rivers, there was a thin veil of past and present. The place felt holy. It is a place to explore alone, but I never felt alone. You could almost hear the singing of Hildegard's nuns amongst the trees on that cold March day. As I discovered, Hildegard's spirit is still alive, ready to awaken us to our own unruly mystic. It may take courage, but the end result is no less than becoming closer to the spirit of God within each of us. I wish to inspire you on your own divine path of creativity and spirituality, the ultimate awakening to your own unruly mystic. That is my intention in this moment. Good morning. I'm very pleased to share with you today an interview we just recently did with Michael Conti, the producer of the film Hildegard and Bingen, a Ruli mystic, the Ruli mystic. And um, I was very pleased with the interview. Michael brings forth his own work as an artist in stirring up uh, the wisdom of Hildegard, but also the wisdom and potential of all of us to be unruly mystics. 
Good morning, Michael Conti. It's our privilege today to have the producer of the wonderful film, Hildegard of Bingen, The Unruly Mystic, with us this morning uh, to talk about Hildegard. Michael, you've done so much research. You've talked to theologians and healers and um, Benedictine sisters in Germany, and you've traveled all around uh, Hildegard's uh, footsteps, if you will, in Europe. Uh, let me begin by asking you, uh, what inspired you, what moved you to put this immense energy into a film project entitled Hildegard of Bingen, The Unruly Mystic? Well, it definitely was something that I was feeling. I, I can't really intellectualize it in terms of having known about Hildegard. I, I maybe knew about her a little bit in art history with the Judy Chicago table setting that, that Hildegard was at. I really felt there was like, I, I didn't really have a feeling until I was in Germany and I was there at her shrine with mm. her relics that I felt this like real visceral kind of emotional connection to something that was, I think I've described it as a river before, mm. um, like something that was flowing and I was like stepping into it. It was a very Wonderful. visceral experience. That's great. Well. Don't apologize for not having intellectual rationale. <laughs> These intuitions, after all, are what art is made of, and uh, prophecy too. So and mysticism. So you're in the right, the right boat in this this river that you felt uh, flowing. Um, among the many people you interviewed and include in your film, um, what most surprised you when uh, learning more about Hildegard? How did she? most startle you, if you will? Well, so b before I went to Germany, I, you know, I was interviewing or videotaping you doing some presentations on, on Hildegard. And so that was, you know, you were doing that here in, in Boulder. And I didn't really, I mean, I was listening to you and sometimes, you know, the information that you were sharing was very intellectual. It was very, um, it was based upon history, it was based upon a lot of other theologians. And, and so, that kind of, sometimes that can be very abstract, but as I started to interview people, including you, I started to get that, that also that, that emotional connection that, that you had, you know, that Carol Beccarello had, that Mary Riemann had, you know, there were all these other people whose stories of how they connected to Hildegard really started to inspire me. And I started to, started to want to explore that narrative of why which, which I think is why I made the film, which is why are we having this connection to this woman who lived 850 years ago? Uh -huh. And today, what would you say, why? Why is Hildegard um, coming home to so many people today, including yourself as a male and as a artist and filmmaker and um, you know, as a spiritual seeker yourself? Well, I think we're I think we're living in a time where we've lost sight of the fact that we have a capacity to be mystics, and we have a capacity to be unruly mystics. And in order to save ourselves and to find, you know, redemption from the world that we've now created around ourselves, we need to go really deep inside to find that true sense of who we are, like Hilde, Hildegard did and then bring that forth as a gift to the world. And I think she shows us that through her immense, what I would call immense creativity. Um, you know, I've called her like the patron saint of creativity, but I don't mean that as, as a solo artist doing their own, own thing, but I mean that as somebody who's prolific, you know, she's a polymath, right? And we only, I only really talk about, you know, the four stages of what I see as her kind of her level of engagement with us, both through you know science, um, art, you know music, and then theology. But she had other things too, right? She had language. She had come up with a language that was going to you know live past Latin. <laughs> um, and I don't. There's probably other things that she was doing. But if more of us were like thinking those ways and being prolific in the work that they were doing, not just to serve their own pockets. Or feed their own bellies, but thinking more about um, society in general, um, we would be in a better place. 
you know, the question, Matthew, I, I like to ask is, um, you know, where have all the mystics gone? You know, why don't we have more saints? Are, are, are they been medicated? Are, I mean, we should have the, we should have, you know, we should have a large number of these people walking around doing things. But I don't hear about them. I, you, you're one of them, obviously, because you're teaching. You're just putting yourself out there. You've been doing that for so many years. So I, I see Hildegard as an example of, of that. If I might respond to that important question of yours, where have all the mystics gone? I, I think what Gregory Bateson said, the scientist, in his last book, I think it was in the 1970s, he said, um, are we rotting our minds? from a slowly deteriorating religion and education. Because I think both those fields, religion and education, have failed us entirely in the West when it comes to developing the mystical mind, the mystical brain, what Einstein calls intuition. And he says only intuition gives us values, that the intellect does not give us values, but we live in a society that whose education is all about the rational. It's all about rewarding uh, the intellect. And, and as he says, it, it ignores uh, the intuitive, or for me, that's what the mystical is. And, um, and the result is, well, <laughs> the mess we have in the world. So I think, I don't think I know religion has failed, even in its seminaries, and certainly in its um, preoccupation with uh, systematic theology and canon law and other left brain items and it has ignored uh, the mystical and um and so there's a there's a conspiracy if you will they're in bed together bad education and bad religion so uh that's how strongly i feel and that's why i've committed my life to both reinventing education and religion and bringing it together in terms of spiritual and the key is art what we call art is meditation so the key is people like yourself artists who are asking these deeper questions and trying to deal with them uh in creative ways like making film and uh so now you brought up the topic of the unruly mystic i want to zero in on that phrase i love it the focus of the phrase where did you come up with that term for the title of your film Hildegard of being on the unruly mystic. Well, it's it's like one of those things that that kind of grabs you, right, and, and and pulls you along. You may not want to be going on that on that journey. Um, it's it's something that it feels to me like um, you know you can you can kind of step into the mysticism, you know, the foggy bog, and and have comfort with that, and that feels comfortable. But going back to that idea of the unruly. You know that river that you're going to jump into is turbulent you know and you may not see what's downstream from you that there's rapids that you're going to fall into so that's the unruly aspect of it um mm -hmm. so those two pieces kind of work together what does unruly mean to you well unruly means somebody who's not afraid to speak out um mm -hmm. I mean, so that's one way and i also think it, as somebody who is as strong strongly spoken um not afraid of um kind of ruffling feathers, um, not somebody who's always polite, um, <laughs> right? Hildegard yeah. was not always polite, that's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah, so. Or uh, politi politically correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, and once again, I think we've come into a place of being too polite, um, and then there's people that feel that they can have a certain stance, you know, but I don't also feel like that's unruly. I feel like that's not thoughtful either. I mean, that's like, that's not mystical. Mm -hmm. you know, that's not the intuitive speaking through you is when you have a stance that you're just never going to change about. Because right. That's it's not coming from the heart. It's coming, coming from, from the heart. Yeah. From a weakness, a failure yeah. of your own ego, probably. Yeah. Well, I like that. In, in another way, then I would take your name unruly is to say the prophetic, because Rabbi Hesha says the prophet interferes. And that's what I hear you saying, that word unruly captures that. It's a wonderful word and I commend you for it. Um, but I do think it's another way of saying the prophetic mystic, if you will, as you say, someone is not afraid to speak out and rock the boat. So um, let's turn now, because now after you made this Hildegard film, you've now developed a whole series of films uh, on unruly 
other unruly mystics. Um, so tell us a few words about these these other projects that you're involved in. So I, I just I want to also state that as a as an artist, and since I I make these, I'm not I'm not doing them with a committee. I'm not doing them for BBC or PBS. You know, my my goal is for the audience to have an experience when they watch the film, and to walk out of the film inspired to to do more with their lives. So you know, with Hildegard, it's 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 spirituality and creativity, and so the goal would be for people to see the film and feel more creative by listening to the other stories of, of people that are sharing their experience through Hildegard. The second film in the series is spirituality and nature and really connecting people back to that feeling of being, being in nature, being someplace special. Um, just yesterday, I was up, up, up on a peak at 13,000 feet. And it just reminds me of what you see when you can look out over the vastness of space. And so for that film, you know, it's John Muir, who is, who is who we as Americans see as, as kind of the, the grandfather of our, our, our national parks. A lot of people don't know about his writings and how he's really preaching. He's taking what he sees in nature and he's preaching it to us in words that really help describe for us how it feels to be in nature. And we have to kind of remove John Muir from the man of the times and the place he was in and really look at his prophetic um, interpretation of, of nature. But I think his language in many ways speaks right into the heart of what many are yearning for today to make such a, an emphatic and passionate connection between spirit and matter. The mystic says yes to life in a deep way and, and experiences the awe and the beauty, but the prophet defends it and fights for it. We have to in internalize, meditate ourselves, make our own pilgrimages into sacred nature like you've done. On a spring equinox in March, I took a solo trip to Canyonlands National Park in Utah. Inspired to visit a specific canyon, I went deep into the wilderness there, to the open skies in Red Rock Canyon. There was no one there that first day of spring. In the isolation, I was surprised to stumble upon a psychic-like bilocation that reminded me of chaos and order. It was nearly identical to my art installation that I had created years earlier. Chaos and order had been formed by natural forces, piles of debris, evidence of flash floods along a dry creek bed. The monolithic structure I had created in the past had met me in the present. It was an awe-inspiring encounter that left me grinning. In my trip out of the canyons, I drove through a wild spring rainstorm, a sudden darkness, and then a magnificent silence followed. And as the sun set, the sandstone crags revealed to me that nature can both bash you and baptize you with her love, all in the same instance. We just need to be present to witness nature's awe that is occurring all around us. Rabbi Heschel says awe is the beginning of wisdom. Heschel uses the phrase radical amazement. Awe is what opens our hearts up because it's something bigger than us. You don't need anyone's permission to experience nature. You just need to get out there. The third film is on spirituality and curiosity and using curiosity from like the scientific standpoint, you know, where science and spiritual science and religion used to be a lot closer connected and they've grown apart over over many many years but curiosity and science and spirituality all kind of are in the same bed and we're we're looking at albert einstein as as an unruly mystic to kind of help us into that that new realm and you know this series can continue to go on with other mystics it's not just limited to these three and um i think i have a list of about 10 that I would like to do. Great. Well, I'm real glad to hear that uh, further explanation of your vocation at this time as you feel called to tell the world not only that there are these unruly mystics, John Muir and Albert Einstein and Hildegard among them, <clears throat> but that we're, we're all capable of being unruly mystics. And just yesterday, like you shared with us, you had obviously a powerful 
experience at the top of the mountain, 13,000 feet. And uh, so we're all prone to this, uh, this breakthrough in terms of love of life and, um, and defending it. So I want to thank you very much for your movies, for your films, and for your um, generosity, because I know that making films is not a, uh, especially when you're starting a whole new project and series, it's not exactly real remunerative right off the bat. But I really thank you for joining us and sharing your films in our class on Hildegard. Thank you, Matthew. Keep up the good work.